business model could be totally disrupted three years, five years. So you don't have a 15-year horizon. You've got to think. I remember Andy Grove, and I, I still say that only the paranoid survive. Now, some people, they become simply paranoid, but they don't change. And that's something that we must try to address in Hong Kong, and especially with the young people, is to give them that positive side so that they don't just get paranoid. But with the paranoia, you must have a positive energy. You must see the bright side of every coin. You must look at the bright side of life and not just be so afraid that you just, then you hide, you withdraw. So I think we need to start to build a community with more care, with more respect. And I think parents have got to cut some slack for their kids and not drive them to a point where they are just, um, you know, they've got to do what my dad says. Hey, actually I didn't, didn't really try that one out on him. Um, I think he would have accepted it if I had flunked out of school. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the signal was so strong that they were always going to be there for me, that even today, I sense that support. So I'm, and I think that's what we need to give to our young people. And I think that's something you have you know, in Silicon Valley. The competition is so tough in Silicon Valley, but you don't mind. Uh, here, where the competition is less tough, yet kids are very fragile. And I think that's where we need to work on, is to get everybody rising up to, and that's why they need to go out and play football. They need to learn to fall down. They need to learn to lose and enjoy the game and come back and play better. So if they stop playing sports, if they stop competing, and are just so afraid and just building their resume, they'll never be entrepreneurial. Hi, Ms. Yang. Um, I really like your idea about change and diversity as an entrepreneur. Um, what other qualities do you think uh, will be important as an entrepreneur? Uh, can you name like two or three of them? Be gutsy enough to wear a pair of jeans and hope that Nick Brooke doesn't think that you're not being respectful. <laughs> I think being a woman, we have an advantage. Practice being an entrepreneur by changing your look every day. Um, and risk being criticized. Because you have an opportunity to put on different facade and what, what that does is that a, a lot of people can't stand criticism. And what, being an entrepreneur, you have to be able to, you have to have thick skin. And you have to be able to, because it's not just, sometimes it's not failure, sometimes people are afraid of criticism. Um, and if you can get into the practice of being criticized constantly, it's an advantage. And the second thing is, um, Learn to love yourself. These are, I think these are all entrepreneurs. The key is to survive. And also have the courage to go and try another. You know, you wake up and you say, okay, it's another day. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, if it didn't work yesterday this way, I'm gonna try something different today. Being an entrepreneur is a lot of it is about being about survival. When, I, when we first started the company, it was a question of cash flow. It was always constantly a question of cash flow. I mean, how to make ends meet. We hold on to the check, bank it in last minute, but you always learn to go and collect the money from your customer. And if it means that you, know, you have to get a 
taxi to get the guy who's sick. We had a, we had a, used to have in Sri Lanka, the government. You always needed this chop, export chop. And there was only one guy who had that chop. <laughs> and he was sick a lot. So we had to go and get a taxi and get this guy back to the office, chop it, and then set it up. So as an entrepreneur, these are the things you learn. How to survive. You know, if I can't, if I'm not getting paid, what's holding it up? Where is the problem? How am I going to go and solve it? If it means getting a cab for the official, uh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. Uh, so being very resourceful and detailed. It's always about details. Because when you're surviving, it's always in the details. Um, I think those are probably the advice I can think of. Yeah, right here. Right here. Can you get the microphone to the next guy? Yeah. Yes. So, uh, could you please cite one or two examples of uh, how you leveraged technologies in your business in the past few years, or how you think you have transformed uh, your business in the recent years? Sure. Um, there were three material science, nanotechnology was a big area. So, of course, in our business, um, nanotechnology is very critical because if you look at the nano, one of the most, um, for our company, one of our uh, main products is a wrinkle-free white dress shirt. Because whenever you, if you're an entrepreneur, you have to look at the market. We sell shirts to men. Men are vain. Therefore, we want to have a shirt that makes every man good looking. Plus, men will not tolerate discomfort. Women will put up, if it looks good, right? <laughs> Women will put up with anything. <laughs> men are much more demanding, right? You want to look great, but you also want the comfort. So, that means a very good white shirt that stays tidy from morning till afternoon and breathes. So it has to be 100% cotton, but it has to be wrinkle free, or at least wrinkle resistant, so that you look good. So, what do we do? We go to Xinjiang to grow to find extra long staple Egyptian cotton because then you can have a very fine cotton, a very light fabric weight. Now, making it wrinkle free always involves putting on some form of ammonia. But with nanotechnology, we now put on a nanoscale polymer that allows the shirt to allows it to breathe as well. So technology has uh, enabled us to create that white shirt that also does not turn yellow after a while. But there we come across another challenge. That shirt, uh, sorry, depends on long stable fiber cotton. Sooner or later, there will not be that much um, farmland. So since the current uh, area that is suitable for Pima Lane cotton is getting smaller and smaller, what are we doing? So now what we do is we go into sequencing, preparing to eventually have to change the ELS so that it can be grown in a less demanding, a less restrictive area. Another example, our company has been able to save water consumption by 20% over the last three years. We are going to be able to do another 20% in the next uh, three years. How are we able to do that unit consumption? A lot of it is changing the whole technology. 
um, we're able to save 15% the kind of technology that is currently being used. A lot of it is engineering. <coughs> it all starts, it's almost everywhere from spinning to um, innovations in spinning, innovations in buying, innovations in um, weaving process, all across. We are funding research to totally get rid of water as a dying media. Now you've probably read in the press that this has already been done only for synthetics. We are focusing that research in cotton, natural fiber. Um, we are, uh, we've saved 15% energy in the last three years. We have another 15% that we have budgeted to save. So all that comes from, of course, some of it comes from better management, um, but a lot of it comes from using better, a, a new generation of technology. We have a lot of engineers who does the last mile. We also fund um, uh, <coughs> original research. We collaborate with universities or uh, suppliers, partners. So for example, we work with a company called Novo Design and together we find better ways of um, saving water. So they do the catalyst. Um, we actually do the final engineering. I don't know if I answered your question. Does it cost much No, no. Um, now, it should, the, the benefit should be even higher if water was actually marked at market. Water is now all subsidized. The reason a lot of our research, we cannot go to, for example, we are ready to do, we are ready to sell our technology engineering for 100% water recycling. The problem, well, water is subsidized. However, if you think about it, industrial water should, will sooner or later go up because China is very short in water. Nobody dares to raise the price of water to consumer and farmers. However, industry, sooner or later, the government will hit industry with a higher cost of water, at which point that will be very, that will be commercially very viable. So yes, in a way, there are some technology that is not commercially viable because the, a lot of natural resources, such as water, is subsidized. But if it wasn't, we had even more competitive advantage. But overall, I would say, in our opinion, technology, um, a lot of the technology pays back very rapidly. Sequencing genome, as the cotton genome is an exception. That, in fact, should not be our work. That should be done by um, probably a government agents, particularly because in our case, we're not allowed to be a seed company in China. So why are we doing it? Partly because I see no choice but to go into that, because nobody else is doing it. But most of the time, it pays back. Okay. We have a few questions here. Yeah. Hello? Hi. Uh, what are you, based on your experience? Uh, hello? Hi. Uh, based on your experience and um, your expertise in this region and manufacturing, what are you most excited about and what are you thinking critically about for your company in the next 5, 10, 20 years? I think we're at a time where we're all exploring <coughs> development model 2.0. And that's what our company is doing. We're really focusing on a new way that um, industry will be operating. We're going to, I think our main challenge is to go B to C. Somebody was saying, this gentleman was earlier saying that um, Change is going to happen in 15 
five years. Now, we have to have at least part of our business going directly to customer. And I'm not trying to get rid of my existing customers, but I have a problem, which is the existing customers on a B2B basis, it's very difficult to introduce really real innovation. For example, in our company, we have developed several technology that produces something that is a replacement for an existing product, uh, an intermediary <coughs> material. The customers comes in, they see this as a substitute rather than something new. <coughs> so they don't pay, they, don't, they give us a discount because they say, well, I am coming in to buy A, and I want A, but I don't want A.1. We, even when we have, when we don't have the direct access to the consumer market, it's difficult to introduce new product concepts uh, because if you sell directly to the consumer, the consumer doesn't care about the intermediary um, building blocks. They are perfectly willing to accept because so long as the end product is good, right? You don't really care how the intermediary building blocks, what is being used, and how you do it. But because it's a B2B relationship, so the buyers are also sometimes becomes a barrier to innovation. So we have to, for us, our company, for us to really go we now have a problem of bringing some of our product pipeline to market because we have a customer who is resisting those kinds of changes or innovations. So we have to have direct access to the consumer market. That's why we have our own brand. Now it's a baby, but it's a start. We have uh, our own brand called Pi, and we're going to be building on that and because we need the direct access to market to innovate even more. I don't know if I've answered your question. Okay. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you, Ms. Yang. This is uh, fascinating. Uh, I just want to bring it back to one point you said earlier, uh, just a little shameless plug, but also you had mentioned uh, critical and independent thinking and for all of you as well to maybe if you want a little, uh, there's an article by Po Chung coming out on Saturday in the SCMP about the, the importance of critical and independent thinking. So, okay, he's my client, let's go inside. The question um, was, for people who are starting, for entrepreneurs, when you're, you don't have a brand, and you're, you're kind of talking about this because you're, you're trying to introduce a new product and a new uh, process, what advice do you have because it's salesmanship, right? So what advice do you have for people who, don't, who aren't established on how to break through and start getting a little bit of business through the door? Because it's not dead, right? So how, how did you do it in the early stages? Or was the company so you know, established that you didn't really worry about it? Be extremely thick-faced um, and just keep on doing it. And if you're single, practice on chasing out the girls. I mean, you know, sell everything, sell yourself, start new. You, when you're chasing out the girls, you're selling yourself, right? You're promoting yourself, it's all the same. So if you have a concept, you just keep on trying it. And then the other, the most important thing is that you don't stop. But you don't also, I think one of the problems with um, young entrepreneurs is that they are in your face. Then you have to tone it down a bit. And they, they're hyper. You know, I, I, have, I, I do some coaching for young entrepreneurs, and I think some of the times you can see that they're so hyperactive, especially our friends from Silicon Valley very much. Well, actually, the Boston group is even worse. <laughs> because okay. most of those guys are nerds. Are we have a couple of what You have the first one, sir, and then we go down. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Lucian. Uh, I'm Alan. Uh, industrial engineer, now working on the manufacturing side. My question to you is, there are always are risks associated with innovations. 
And what is your criteria to accept certain innovation and reject the others? You know, actually, your answer previously had partly made to that. You accept your customer and not accept your innovations. But that doesn't mean that we've given up. So of we'll course. find another way of pitching it. So what, what are your criteria to accept them? Especially on intangible things. Uh, okay, all right. Then I think it, we can go back to our uh, five E's. You know, if it is if this is good for the environment, we would normally go after it. Um, if it is, um, it's it's something that will excellence. You know, if it allows us to do something better, do some, for example, energy consumption. If it uh, saves energy, we will pursue it. So we have a way of filtering out the kind of uh, uh, research and development for us um, by looking at the impact on our company. So for example, another filter is workers' productivity. If it helps workers' productivity, we'll use it. How does, what kind of mobility applies to us? Well. Um, we looked at pocket view, and if, they, if the mobility allows us to use that as a way of training a person, we'll accept that. But, but when, I think what you mean is when do you ditch an innovation? You? Is, is that what you mean? Yeah. It's very simple. Yeah, when, even, you can't if, if, it, when you can't <laughs> afford it. I have a question. Uh, you were talking, talking about having your company turn pay slips into a technology-based system now, correct? And uh, in the States, we use independent companies, like I use ADT for payroll. It's all outsourced. It's not done in-house. Is Are there companies in China doing that already, what you're doing, and would you think of expanding it to becoming a business of its own, available to other companies? The technology part is so simple, you don't really need to go outside. I mean, it's just writing a simple app. I mean, your payroll system is sitting in the back, right? The difficult part is introducing this different way to the workers. You have people who are used to going and signing. Now you want them to just accept the number based on an app. How do you get people to be comfortable? How do you get people to adopt that change? That's the difficult part. We've got, in one location, the location where this was introduced, we have 30,000 people. So getting 30,000 people to switch over, and then you get interesting questions like, but I don't want my husband to know how much I get paid. Mm -hmm. So if it's on my phone, he will find out. Ah, the answer is, delete the app after you done it. Load it the next time you need it. Ah, and then the girl will say, yes, 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 yes. So, but you have, to, you have to have people who are capable of um, catering to their concerns and then getting them and once you move a thousand, two thousand, you gradually can get all thirty thousand migrated. Now we have another opportunity because even the cleaning lady got interested. So now that the cleaning lady is interested, we can move more onto this platform. We can probably put the company bus schedule and what is the current status of the bus after work, should you stay in for an extra five minutes so that you don't have to stand in line? Those will be saving time for the workers. So there's all kinds of opportunity in mobility. We're right, right now uh, mo uh, uh, converting all 58,000 of our workers around the world. So it's taking us a while because we have to translate it into different languages. But the key is, again, it's really I think innovation, especially uh, for an audience like this, I think you'll probably agree with me. Technologies, there's an abundance. Question is, how do you get it to create value? So it's getting people to accept it, 
and then having them use it in a way that saves time for them. So I think that's the key. Okay. We have another question here. Hi. Uh, thanks, Ms. Han, for sharing your experience. I, I would like to bring the point back to your B2C company, and I was wondering, um, if you don't mind me asking, how well does having a, a very in-depth uh, manufacturing background help aid you in creating a business-to-consumer uh, retailing company? I mean, it, time and again, we see people that boast of having a superior product, but it's very difficult to cons uh, convince the consumer that essentially this is the better or a cheaper, cheaper alternative or a better product at a lower price because they're just not very confident for that. It, it's a completely different beast of asking to do marketing when you've been mainly dealing in manufacturing. We have a, total, a separate group that does this. So they even sit in a different office from our salespeople who are used to selling um, to a, a customers on a B2B basis. And they think differently. And uh, they struggle just as hard because they are a startup company. They get bullied a lot because they're small. The, the, the parent company is big <coughs> enough that we don't get bullied that much. But they are really a startup, so they get bullied a lot. Um, they, for example, when you go to a landlord and you want to rent a space, they say, who the hell are you? You know. Um, <laughs> so you get all that. Plus, they have to understand what is the unique strength of the parent use that. So if they do, if in this startup, they go and try to sell basketball, there's no advantage to them, right? Why would they, why would they have a unique advantage? So they have to understand what is the unique advantage of the parent, and then within that, build a business. So it is not easy. And that's why a lot of times, a startup within a a parent, a, a bigger group, gets creamed. And also because, for example, the finance department, they don't understand. And especially in Hong Kong, most finance company, uh, departments are control, financial controller. They're not your business partner. <laughs> so the startups, it's, it's got to run in a totally different way. The finance, they beat you up. They treat you like a small department in a well Run, run a business, whereas you're really a startup and you have to be given a very different set of, you know, a different mindset. So it's not easy to run a small department, a small startup in a big company. We have three small, we call them high poles in our company. Um, one is really in material science. Uh, one is in really in packaging, packaging and designing, and one is in uh, retailing, uh, branding. And they all have a hard time, so it's difficult. The only benefit, you got a sugar daddy. Big <laughs> difference. <laughs> question here, then question back there. Um, so a big part of being a good entrepreneur or leader is dealing with adversity. Um, I'm curious, uh, in the light of the recent events in Vietnam, how, um, what immediate effects do you see on your business, and what the long-term effects you see on this business, on your business, and more importantly. How will you resolve the situation and sustain the resolution? I was hoping that somebody would ask me because I think this is key to being an entrepreneur. So for those of you who don't know, um, SKL has three, com uh, three factories in Vietnam and one of them with 55,000 people were um, uh, partially destroyed by as a result of the demonstrations and riots last last week. So this is where leadership becomes critical. The first thing you do is to think of the worst case scenario and see how you will, can you survive. And this is, I guess, partly because we're big enough that the first thing I did was I, I, I was with my CFO and I said, tell me the worst, worst scenario. Okay. 
Now, I said, okay, that's going to hurt, but we can, we can take the blow. Then, I had all these guys running around. The all, this is where the men, men had to be very careful. They were so brave, but when they saw one, one of, two of them broke down in tears when they started burning, the report came that they started burning the factory. And I since then scolded them. I said, you cannot cry at this time, no matter how sentimental it is to you, because your people, they will cry with you. Fortunately, we have a lot of tough women. <laughs> <laughs> what happened is, so I mean, all these men, they were, they, they were actually, they were being very good. I'm, I'm just poking fun of them. But, our, so, the factory was, um, they were rushed, and the workers were sent home, but the local colleagues were so good, they covered the Chinese colleagues, which are very few, but they protected them and got them out of there. So at that point, the instruction was for everyone to evacuate because what's the point of having security there when your, you know, your, your whole, there's no premise because they broke down the gate, they, they broke down the, uh, the security, and it was very dangerous. The security the, insisted that would stay, that they would stay overnight. But they're Vietnamese. The head, I didn't know at the time, but the head of the security is a woman. She was very calm, so they did not provoke the rioters. So they, uh, they took over 300 computers, they took the servers, they took a lot of the apparels that were made, but they allowed them but they did not confront them, you know, they did not like fight them or any, because there's no way you can fight them. There, there were just such a huge number. But instead, they protected the sprinkler system, so the place was not burnt down. The next morning, at um, seven o'clock, the workers came back, many of them holding signs to say, protect the factory, protect our jobs. And there's a very touching picture of these young women. Meanwhile, these men were you know, really in tears because it is very heartbreaking to see um, your sort of work of, say, six years just uh, demolished. So um, the workers went there, and then by around noontime, the police came. Uh, lots of stories here, lots of cycles of learning. Uh, our IT team, miraculously, so our IT team, uh, uh, inside, uh, a lot of the sewing machines were disabled. Um, all the electronic equipment were uh, not functioning. But we are going to go back uh, partial operation this coming Monday. It's a miracle. It's a complete miracle. But it was because the attitude of the people. So as an entrepreneur, one must learn one thing. People makes all the difference. The attitude of the people and the team spirit for SCAL to go start operation on this coming, this coming Monday we are going to start operation. To me, it's a real miracle. I did not expect that. But because of the attitude of the, the, whole, the whole team there, as well as the, uh, like our IT department, they were kicking themselves because they, they said, we still had so much client-server um, program that had, they moved, had we moved to cloud, they wouldn't have this problem. Right? So, but then immediately they formed Houston Center. They formed Houston Center in Hong Kong. 
and, and our Malaysia operation, they sent their people, they hand carried PCs over, they hand carried, I mean, they, they flew over, everybody pitched in. And it is truly a miracle that we are going to start operation this coming Monday. So as an entrepreneur, you have to remember, miracles do happen. There is really a Santa Claus. Because as an entrepreneur, if you don't believe in Santa Claus, you shouldn't be an entrepreneur. <laughs> and this is the Escal story. And if you, you know, this is incredible. On, on last Tuesday, I was, I was asking my CFO, what if it's a complete write-off? And, uh, and they're telling me that they're going to be able to, with the whole group pitching, they're probably going to be able to meet 70% of the month's target. They make a, a million pieces of knit shirts uh, and 55,000, uh, 5,500 girls. So if you do, if you manage right, if you ma and this is because the management there has been doing all the right things. They've been doing, um, they've been localizing, so we have very few expats. We're very few, we, we did not really rely on any, um, we, we didn't have to really uh, rush a lot of people out. Provided quality employment. The technology that we had put in enabled these girls to make a living that was, that made them treasure their employment. And that's why they came back to protect the factory. Because they treasure their job. Um, so the technology works. And now it's a question of, okay, we use lean, we practice lean, and therefore there's very little work in progress on the shop floor. And therefore, uh, uh, the lean is also, although the lean and the IT guys constantly have an argument because we use a lot of sensors in tracing work in progress to minimize and optimize workflow. But when you use lean, you take out all the intermediary measurements because you don't care. And all you're doing is just going for, you do on the spot improvements. But at the end of the day, good management, good people will get you satisfied employees who will do miracles, perform miracles. And I think that's, the, I think that's, this is important. As entrepreneurs, you must believe in miracles. Because for any startup to succeed, it's a miracle. Because it's against odds. A question back there. Hello, Mr. Yang. Um, my name is Tony. I'm with an organization called TIE, T-I-E. I believe you're a sponsor. Uh, I have some colleagues with me down by the front, Ian and Jane. So we, spawn, we foster innovation and entrepreneurship as successful entrepreneurs. And yourself, you're a successful entrepreneur. I wonder, have you got, come to a, a stage where you would become an angel investor or a mentor to help people outside your organization grow? Yes, I mentor. I, I have a lot of guys that so, I eat up on. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so I, I do some mentorship in City University, and I came across a stunning apparel, uh, an apparel uh, startup done by some students. I would like to show you later, because I, you're the expert in that. I'm not industry. an expert, you know. Actually, I'm not really. Like some, you know, people keep on going to my LinkedIn uh, account and uh, endorse me for things like no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> I don't even know how to measure somebody for a shirt. I'm not really, I'm probably the last person in my company who knows anything about textile or apparel. I don't really, I'm, I'm the fairy godmother. I don't do real life um, apparel business. I teach my people how to become leaders. So they run the business. So for a long time, I have not touched the apparel business. And that is a trick. 
You learn not to know anything about the business so that you can empower. Because if I know too much about the business, I will interfere. Not that I don't want to look at the Harold startup. But I'm going to send help. it to you anyway. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Another question. Uh, Ms. Yang, thank you very much for this uh, afternoon sharing your knowledge. Uh, we keep hearing about the glass ceiling for women in the board of directors. I mean, it's a good segue how you broke that and should share some of those learnings as you went about in creating your career in the upper industry. So what's the question? Uh, we, we keep hearing about a lot of glass ceiling mm -hmm. that women don't make to the board. Oh, okay. I thought you were going to ask about independent boards. Yes, I was, was very privileged to be on, served on several boards. And do I feel that there's a glass ceiling for women? Yeah, as well as if there is some insights in how to make it to the board, how to function as a woman in a okay. more there is a, world. All right. It's like being a lefty who plays tennis. There are, I was taught early on by my father that, yes, you're a woman, you're dis disadvantaged, and there are a lot of disadvantages as women. But what we have to do is think of all the opportunities that we have. So it's almost like a, being a lefty. So not very many people, because most people are men, they think in a certain way. And for those of us who are women, we think in a different way. And then we don't pretend to be a man and think like a man, or try to think like a man. We've got a unique way of uh, operating. Very, uh, give you an example. Early on, my father, we were talking, we were sitting around saying that we wanted to go and renegotiate the lease on the property that for our office at that time. And um, so it was a question of who should go. And we wanted an ex a very low, say the landlord wanted uh, 50, we wanted to pay um, 10. Okay. So I was voted to go because my father says, See, it's okay for a woman, especially a young woman, to go and ask a, a stupid question like, how about 10? <laughs> <laughs> but you take advantage of that. So you make full use of the fact that you know, you're young, and you go and ask, can, I, can we pay half this? We're a very, very good tenant. Can we have this place for $10? So you use your, and I think one of the problems is that we don't teach, our, very often we teach our women to act like men in corporate environments. When I coach women, I always tell them, be a woman, don't be a man. If you're a man, you're a second-rate man. <laughs> if you're a woman, you're a world-class woman. So be a woman. But I think it's also because we don't have enough women role models who comes in and says that, that women, because they see so many male role models, so they start to adopt some of, they think that that's the way to do it. And forget that, the advantages of being a woman gets slighted. So there are distinct advantages of being a woman. You just, but being a woman is very tough. So you have to think of all the distinct advantages as a woman to offset that toughness. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, my name is Joshua Wong. I'm a retired uh, professor from the Polytechnic University where you are the council person. Um, my question is, you know MIT and you know Hong Kong, how would you describe the synergy uh, between MIT <coughs> and NASA science parks? I believe 
did not have air conditioning <laughs> until quite recently. But we had a fantastic atmosphere. And hardware doesn't buy you that academic, the pursuit of that, that energy to pursue academic excellence, which is also critical for any kind of in, innovation. I believe that it's the passion to, for that subject, even if you're not going to make any money. I keep saying that you have to survive, that's because we have to eat, but the passion for whatever you're doing, even if it means that you have to do it in the corridors, uh, without air conditioning, Science Park, we put a lot of, it's a beautiful place. I think it's almost too beautiful. Uh, I find that I, I, I come from a, you know, a, a time when you're almost proud to be in an environment where the infrastructure is not that good. Uh, so having an infrastructure like this, I don't know, I, I think it's scary. It's also scary because it's overhead. It's, you know, it's, you feel that, um, uh, I, I am a little bit, I, I don't know, I mean, people say that you have to have the infrastructure to attract the people. Um, Perhaps what we need to focus on is really passion for some um, for problem solving. MIT is a place that is very unique because it was built to solve problems and specific problems. So, for example, right now it's energy or really cracking um, cancer. So let's take the energy initiative. Hong Kong should pick some problems that we are, um, we are enrolled with and really focus and dwell on using technology as a way to solve these problems. We have an urban structure that is heavily, I mean, it's overloaded. We're overloading our urban structure. How can we use science and technology to use our existing urban structure more efficiently? That's a problem. And as you probably also know, um, Polly Yu, which we're trying to lobby the entire university, we have, we're sitting at the front, I mean, at the tunnel. So we are breathing some of the worst air we as a university should use this as a challenge to come up with a solution. So we are now proposing the green deck. We'll deck it over, use technology that we believe will work to filter out the uh, uh, pollutants, change the environment, not just for ourselves, but also for the community. I believe that we shouldn't be talking about innovation as a general subject, I think we should tackle some specific problems and really go after it. And at the res as a result, the byproducts, the fallout, will be innovation, and um, and a society will start to respect technology. I think there are a lot of skeptics in Hong Kong who don't really believe. In this room, we don't have a problem because I think we're this is the converted, but. There are a lot of people out there who really do not believe that, um, although they don't understand that, in fact, Hong Kong, for Hong Kong to work so well, there's a lot of underlying um, technology um, that is already being used. It's just that they don't see it. So we need to do something that are visible. We need to market. We need to market technology to the community. So we need to tackle visible problems, such as the green deck. I am of the opinion, even if the Green Deck never gets approved to be built, we should still, as a university, put money into researching, getting students, getting faculty 
involved, um, and then showcasing our proposed uh, solution. And we're in a place, Science Park has another disadvantage. The general population doesn't circulate around here. But at Poly U, we're sitting in the middle of the town. We can draw a lot of attention. And this is something that I, I think we, we should do more. Thank you. <laughs> Just a quick question. It's related to the young gentleman's question about Vietnam. Do you have operations in Bangladesh? And no. No, you don't. Okay. Because my next question was, how are you responding to the, yeah, the class of the building? But never mind. Oh, with anger. Yeah. <laughs> I, but even if you don't have operations, are you partaking in that whole setting up um, some sort of rules and regulations of it? Because the whole garment industry is also involved. Okay. I don't, you know, for very early on, I, I, I don't like the garment industry. Um, I believe in if people come and we are looked down upon, uh, the garment industry is looked down upon, and so bias will come and everybody will throw a set of rules at you because they need to sort of make it appear that they are doing their job. But is that really helping the end? You think about it, the amount of money that goes to auditing factories, why not just put that in the money and give it to the workers? Why not agree on a set of common audit why have 10 different, 10 customers will give you 10 sets of different audit standards? One will say the exit sign has to be on the wall. The other one will say, no, 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 it has to be painted on the floor. So I think the garment industry, it's up to the garment industry to regain the respect of the customers. For people, we're not, we're not children. To have people come and tell you, uh, you need to look after your workers. That's already a problem. And if you're prepared to accept that kind of insult without doing something, you're not really going to change. Right? Because you're a person with no self-respect. Anybody with some self-respect would say, after the first time that somebody says, you have to do this, and these are my people, and I'm not taking good enough care of them, I will go and do something about it. Correct? So. So you're in the mind that the outside foreign countries should not be involved in the sort of restructuring of uh, the garment industry in Bangladesh, that it is their problem and they need to resolve it? Or are you in the mind of that foreign countries, uh, foreign companies should go in and set standards? I don't, so, sorry. You know, <laughs> a lot of times people telling other people what to do. It's like, I used to, we don't use any child labor, but I don't like to. I don't like to sit and accuse other people of using child labor. Because what are the alternatives? Do I really know? Because what was the consequence of having children lose work? What really? You know, it, it sounds very good. It's sort of like let them eat cake. But I don't like to sit there and um, judge others. And I think too often because we want to look good to the end consumer. The other thing is, end consumers don't like to pay yeah. for what they believe in. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that, I think, is another, you know, it's another, it's a, in a way, it's a hypocrisy. Yeah. So I don't like goody, goody, you know, um, and this is a, Okay, here's a lesson for entrepreneurs. There, there's too many people who will push you around, and um, I think if so long as you're doing the right thing, that's the key. I, I'm on camera, so I don't want to address this. <laughs>
Uh, do you have any idea to moving out of uh, mainland and move your operations to other uh, parts of Asia? Like, uh, like, um, no, the no, because I tell you, I was. I always ask, whenever you talk to people, uh, what's the biggest challenge for garment manufacturers? They'll always say, oh, I don't have enough good workers. They never say that I don't have enough sewing machine. No. So if that is the case, if you think about our case, we have just got, we've just had 5,500 people demonstrating that they are world-class, devoted employees, willing to work, and ready to work, and brave enough to protect their jobs and protect our assets. Wow, that's a tremendous asset that we are going to leverage on. So we're going in, having been dealt a setback. And this is important for entrepreneurs. You, bad things will happen to you all the time. Important thing is, then take count of what are the good things. Yes. We lost a lot of physical, we lost, we're, we're losing money. We're, we definitely are losing money. We've lost money. Yeah. But you've got to look at the bright side. You've got 5,500 good workers. Isn't that something to celebrate? So why would I move? I'm jumping right in there to ride on the way of the team spirit and also thinking about a cycle of learning from this to go and build a stronger operation there and how that can also uh, stimulate the other factories. This kind of esprit de corps, how it will infect the other factories. So as an entrepreneur, you must think, you must always take inventory of the good things that comes with them. Yeah. Another question? Uh, hi, I'm Miss Yang. I'm from Prodi as well. Um, in your views, um, what is your views on the innovation and technology development of the local apparel industry and your op opinion on the government support of this aspect comparing with other countries? Okay. Uh, our company has always <coughs> been, because we never we never really, we were always in overseas locations. So we never went to government for support. And I think that's key. Any, any time you become addicted to government support, you lose your strength as an entrepreneur. <laughs> the second thing is, the local uh, Hong Kong apparel industry is too addicted to cheap labor. If you think about it, in fact, a lot of the problems of the apparel industry stems from the fact that they are, we are too addicted to competing with cheap labor. If you think about all of China, the whole opening up of China, what's the purpose? It's for everyone to get rich. So why is it surprising that after 30 years of successful opening up of China, that the workers are now richer, have more choices? Why should it come as a surprise? In fact, that's good news, right? So all that means is that people like us, we just need to change our competitive advantage. So we need to find other forms of competitive advantage. I think if people in Hong Kong um, will just uh, not, not all people, but uh, the, uh, the, a lot of the apparel companies in Hong Kong. But I, I will have a... Uh, if they are willing to accept the fact that it's changing, don't just think about moving, but think about changing the competitive advantage. Government subs, uh, help in because they don't really know. They don't really know your unique business. It's difficult for government or any outside person to help me unless 
Because who knows my business the best? It's me. Or I, I, as earlier I mentioned, I don't know anything about power manufacturing, <laughs> but it's my people. So having an outsider come in, they're generalist. They're, they're not really, that's not the, I, I don't really believe that government can help industries or companies to compete. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Questions back there? <sighs> Hi. Um, could you share with us? Uh, you talk about a lot, a lot about innovations and R and D and a lot of advanced technology. Would you share with us how your company now are protecting your intellectual properties and uh, you know to take advantage of your, your uh, what do you call it? Uh, intellectual property. Yeah. Um, okay. So sometimes we file patents. Sometimes. We don't because once you file, you just lost it because uh, you know it becomes uh, known to everyone. So, especially in China, a lot of my colleagues say that they don't file; they would rather not file for protection, so that they are protected for a longer time. So it's it's entirely up to the specific division how they handle it. So we don't. That's why we decided not to have any kind of a bonus system or um, a KPIs for them. Uh, we leave it up to um, the individual, because we have several uh, centers of research doing research and development work. But we, um, we did have experience with um, a patent case in the US, which we eventually won, but we paid heavily for that. So once you get embroiled in a patent um, litigation, there's no winner except the lawyers. Yes. And um, this is this is, but this is the, this is the name of the game. This is the name of the game. So I think it's um, you have to have a clear strategy about where you're headed with that. But a lot of the startup companies that I'm an angel with investor in, they've got technology that if had it not been the technology, they can't pay the bill. So there uh, it really gives them protection. So I don't know, I don't know how to answer your question. Okay. Any final questions? We have time for two more. Okay. Microphone here. Hi, um, I'm wondering if you have a percentage of um, your income, a percentage of profit that you limit to how much you invest into innovation or how to improve your businesses? <laughs> this is it. Okay, this is important. We've never used up our R&D budget. Uh, so, isn't, isn't that interesting? I mean, don't you, you guys find this interesting? Every year, we have, and it's not a very aggressive one. We're not targeting, you know, drug pharmaceuticals, but manufacturing companies are very cautious with spending money. So we're now encouraging, we're now having seed funds. We've created something called, within the company, a venture seed fund. So getting more people, it's enticing. So the corporate um, R&D, of course, you know, you can fund universities. The, the, you know, if you go to Poly U and just say, that, oh, I have a budget, they'll use it up for you immediately. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, to have, so the university research budget, we have certain, a certain universities, that's not a problem. But then to encourage more people to do R&D, that takes some, um, Managing, so we are now starting a seed fund to to entice more uh, research work within the company. If you're in a pharmaceutical company, you'll never have that problem because I sat on the board of Novartis uh, before, and you never have that problem. But being a manufacturing company, uh, a paratextile company, uh, then you have a problem spending more when you want to spend more. 
It's very interesting. All right, so you're saying you reward them when they yes. do something? When you spend money, spend more money. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay. Any final questions? Yep, microphone here. My name is William Sim. So, uh, going to your R and D, never spend out uh, R and D uh, money. Uh, I'm, I'm interested to know how much, what is the percentage of uh, funding we will allocate out of your profits or turnover for R and D? Three percent. Three percent. It's pretty high for a factory. It's what? It's pretty high for yes. a factory. Thanks. Question here. Uh, hello. Uh, do you have any idea for... That's why it's never spent. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, do you have any idea for university uh, to nurture new uh, young generation to be an entrepreneur? In how yes. the university should do to nurture the student to be a new entrepreneur? Okay. And this is not to go back to Poly U. <laughs> because PolyU has, and as with a lot of other universities, have a lot of programs that fund seed, uh, give, or you know, entrepreneur programs. If I were, if I, I, uh, I would design it differently. I would say let's focus on building, and this is specifically in Hong Kong. Let's just focus on showing more tender, loving care first to the faculty and then to the students because the key is to build that sense of trust and respect within the community so that every student becomes empowered because they feel then that they are, they are loved. Then they have the energy to go and, and they've got the guts to go and be an entrepreneur. So in fact, you're making every person in, the, in that community a more entrepreneurial person. Rather than just, I, I find it very, too often, I think society, everybody is using this term and it's almost like to measure how many successful entrepreneurs. I believe that for a society to be, if we could get each person to be more entrepreneurial, that's the way to do it, rather than um, having entrepreneurial training programs. Okay. Any further questions? Yep, right in the middle. Good afternoon. Uh, yes, may I know um, your thoughts? Do you think that your success of the company due to you owned your own factories? That is, if by removing all your own factory, um, do you still think that your company can still able to keep the business that you have? I think if we don't, if we, um, that there's two, Harvard Business School always uses as Cal versus Lee and Fong as two different models. Um, I think as a business financial model, they're much more successful than we are. Um, we're a much smaller company. But I think for what we are trying to do, we cannot achieve our goal without owning our factories. Because what we're trying to do is really find a, ours is almost, and we're definitely not a social enterprise because we, we do <coughs> take making money very seriously. However, I think that a lot of people are at SCAL because we almost feel as though we have a very unique opportunity to um, make a difference. And so for us, it's having people and then having our own people to um, experiment on how to raise the productivity of our entire community. And it's difficult to do if you don't own that factory because even if we, as now, as we own it, we still have to, um, for example, if we didn't own it, we can't say that, oh, 
you have to have 30% of the supervisors with the ability to communicate. They're not gonna, if, you, if you don't, you're uh, if subcontracting, you can't possibly do that. Um, but now, because we're introducing so much change, we're introducing, you pay apparel sewers, you pay them, they say, you pay me for the number of shirts I make. My job is not to ensure data integrity within the shop floor, but for us, we're using this to optimize the line flow, therefore increasing their productivity. But you need an intermediary who can explain this to the worker. So for us, we need to change the supervisors. Also, our supervisors now must have ability to communicate better because they are tasked with more training. Therefore, we want to have a higher percentage of supervisors with almost, well, with either a diploma or the equivalent of the ability of um, a diploma holder, the qualification. And you have to do it yourself. Also, using culture and changing the mindset, we don't go and tell people you have to treat people right. We create the environment because we don't use rules anymore. It would be crazy, it would completely defeat our um, whole uh, exercise if we had to go and say that, hey, you can't lock people up because number one, ethics. You know, our whole goal. So we, we it's a whole, um, it's a lifestyle. It's, it's a, a culture we, we are uh, committed to transmit this message even to the tea lady. When we had an audit, one of our external directors actually went and talked to one of our tea ladies. And that's how you get a whole company to believe and then follow in that direction um, to change. So I don't think that you can do it without really owning um, and being one company, I mean one family, I would find it very difficult. Okay, um, we're coming to the close. One last question, anybody? No, then I'm going to ask. E-commerce, that, that's your big opportunity. Um, I, I think that's going to overtake bricks and mortar yes. in the next year or so. Yes. Um, are, are, are you on that bandwagon in terms of B2C? We're very, very dedicated to that, but I don't think that we should be in a hurry to have the um, presence because I think it's more important for us to have a pick and pack warehouse, an ability to have the forecasting. So all the back end, because for somebody like us, we can't afford, afford to fall down on our face. Um, so when we go, we have to be able Particularly because um, you know we have, even if we are supporting, even if we don't go B to C, even if we're supporting a customer, they are. It's the back end, and we're prepared, very prepared to. Um, in fact, one of our big investments is in a pick and pack warehouse, and also we're building up our ability to have better inventory management and forecasting ability to service. Um, e-commerce. Okay. Sounds like a great way to end. Um, I'm just going to remind everyone, if you fill in your little survey, you get one of these 80 um, gigabyte um, um, <laughs> crystal um, UBSs. Um, and we've had about four speakers this year. And Marjorie, I just want to say thank you. It's been wonderful having you here. And um, 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 I want you all to uh, just uh, show your appreciation, appreciation in the normal way. So thank you.
to open it. Oh, I just wanted to share a quote with, um, I brought the book, I got this uh, new book from MIT. Um, it's called The Second Machine Age. Uh, Eric Hearn Lofsen and uh, Andrew McAfee. And I love this quote, because I just got it. So, technology is a gift of God. After the gift of life, it is perhaps the greatest of God's gifts. It is the mother of civilizations, of arts, and of sciences. Freeman Dyson. So with that, thank you very much. Also, please join us for a drink um, um, afterwards. And again, thank you, Margie. Thank you. It's too well packed.